Good afternoon. Uh, we have an overflow audience inside this room. Uh, obviously, lots of cameras beaming this event to uh, places far and wide, and we have an overflow room as well. Uh, and uh, the Wilson Center is truly honored to host this event. Um, I'm welcoming some of our nearest and dearest supporters. I think Representative Jim Himes of Connecticut is here or will be here. Um, I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center. Fifteen years ago, a disgruntled Australian contractor hacked a sewage control system in Queensland, spilling millions of gallons of waste onto public lands and into public waters. All it took him then was a laptop and a radio. Today, our infrastructure is increasingly networked, Rail switches, water mains, power grids. Americans' lives are more vul vulnerable than ever to digital disruption. The hacker black market has flourished. You can buy zero days for a song. For would-be cyber terrorists, the limit isn't resources anymore. It's creativity. Crafting a secure internet and securing America's place in cyberspace is a huge technical and leadership challenge. It's our digital Apollo program. Here at the Wilson Center, we've invested intellectually in cyber. We think ahead of the news cycle to focus on the digital security risks posed by non-state actors. We're attracting key scholars to study the challenge from all angles. We're regularly hosting off-the-record dialogues, and we're very grateful to hear today from one of this administration's senior leaders on cybersecurity issues. I often say if you want to get the job done right, put a woman in charge. Well, in this case, let's give a shout out to three. Uh, number one, Caroline Crency, who came to us uh, from the basement of the White House. She had to adjust to the fact that we had windows with real uh, sunlight coming in. Uh, number two, to Meg King, who is uh, my right-hand woman and the head of our cyber initiative at the Wilson Center and is n building our capacity enormously. And number three is Lisa Monaco, Homeland Security Advisor to the President, uh, who is here to discuss the administration's cyber strategy. Lisa has the worst job in Washington and one of the most essential. We're glad to give her an hour's escape today at the Wilson Center. Uh, people pay lip service to the cyber challenge Lisa lives it. Before this job, Lisa was the first Assistant Attorney General for National Security who happens to be a woman. She clearly got excellent training for her various positions at the start of her career as an intern uh, with the Wilson Quarterly. So from our point of view, this is a homecoming, and it comes as both the White House and Congress are seeing where they can have a significant impact impact on the enormous cyber challenge. Obviously, the administration has a crucial role to play, directing the Department of Homeland Security to partner with the private sector. There's some real progress there. Shaping standards and using the bully pulpit to build trust between key cyber constituencies. The White House has tried to move forward in the absence of congressional action by issuing executive orders. And Lisa is here today to announce a new center similar to the ones we have for counterterrorism and counterproliferation. The hack of Anthem Insurance last week highlights how urgent these efforts are. Anthem joins a long list of high-profile hacking victims, Sony, Target, J.P. Morgan, and even the background check contractor that clears employees for the Department of Homeland Security, our lead agency on cybersecurity. So, uh, once again, we're thrilled to have uh, the main man in the White House on these issues, Lisa Monaco. Uh, she's Wilson Center alum and Homeland, advi Homeland Security Advisor to President Obama. Uh, Counterterrorism Advisor. Homeland Security Advisor. Both. Well, it takes a woman to get the job done right. Please welcome uh, Lisa Monaco. Thank you very much, Jane, for the uh, very kind words. Uh, it is very nice uh, to be back. Uh, 
as Jane mentioned, uh, my first job in Washington, actually, post-college, was here at the Wilson Center uh, when it was a paper quarterly. Now, of course, like everything, it's gone digital. Before I get to my main uh, topic today, though, uh, with your permission, Jane, I'd like to say a few words about the very, very sad news of this morning. It is with deep sadness that we have confirmed the death of Kayla Jean Mueller. Today, our hearts go out to her family, and my thoughts in particular are with her parents, Carl and Marsha Mueller, who have shown such grace and strength and dignity over many, many difficult months. My thoughts are with Carl and Marcia, Kayla's brother Eric, and the rest of her family, because Kayla represented the best of us, her generous spirit, and her legacy of compassion in her selfless works for those in need should serve as an inspiration to all of us. So thank you again, Jane, for having me. And I want to thank those at the Wilson Center for hosting me. Um, the job that I hold, as Jane, I think, rightly observed, uh, is one that normally keeps me in the basement of the White House. I'd say usually it's nice to get out because I get to go see the sunlight, but uh, you didn't serve up a, a, any windows in this room. As the President's Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor, I brief him every morning on the most significant, destructive, and frankly horrific threats facing the American people. I'm oftentimes, as the President reminds me, the bearer of bad news. Since I began this job two years ago, I can tell you that an increasing share of the bad news I deliver is unfortunately on cyber threats. In just the last nine months, we've seen a growing list of high-profile targets. Home Depot, J.P. Morgan Chase, Target, Sony Pictures, Centcom, and the U.S. Postal Service, to name just a few. We are at a transformational moment in the evolution of the cyber threat. The actions we take today and those we fail to take will determine whether cyberspace remains a great national asset or increasingly becomes a strategic liability, an economic and national security strength, or a source of vulnerability. So today, I want to talk about the threat we face and the administration's approach to countering it, drawing on counterterrorism lessons learned from the last decade of war. Now, let me start with the facts. According to a recent United States government assessment, cyber threats to our national security and economic security are increasing in their frequency, in their scale, their sophistication, and the severity of their impact. The range of cyber threat actors, methods of attack, targeted systems, and victims are expanding at an unprecedented clip. The pace of cyber intrusions have also ticked up substantially. Annual reports of data breaches have increased roughly five-fold since 2009. And the seriousness of those breaches is also rising causing significant economic damage. No one, it seems, is immune. From healthcare companies, as Jane mentioned, and universities, to the tech industry, critical infrastructure, and the entertainment sector. Just last week, as has been noted, Anthem, one of the nation's largest health insurance providers, announced that hackers had breached a database containing the personal information of 80 million customers and employees. And inside the United States government, we know that state and non-state actors, terrorists, hackers, and criminals are probing our networks every day, seeking to steal, to spy, to manipulate, and to destroy data. At the state level, threats are coming from nations with highly sophisticated cyber programs, including China and Russia and nations with less technical capacity but greater disruptive intent, like Iran and North Korea. 
Several nations regularly conduct cyber economic espionage for the commercial gain of their companies. And politically motivated attacks are growing, and they are a growing reality, as we saw with North Korea's attack on South Korea and its banks and media outlets last year. As for non-state actors, threats are increasingly originating from profit-motivated criminals, so-called hackers for hire, those who would steal your information and sell it online to the highest bidder. Transnational criminals use cyber as a vector for profit. And there are, of course, the ideologically motivated hackers and terrorists. You've got groups like Anonymous that thrive on creating disruptions on companies' websites and leaking personal information online. You've got groups like the so-called Syrian Electronic Army, which conducts cyber attacks in support of the brutal regime in Syria. And then there is ISIL, which has harnessed social media for a propaganda machine that's radicalizing and recruiting young people to their hateful message around the world. Most concerning on the cyber front, perhaps, is the increasingly destructive and malicious nature of cyber attacks, as we saw with Sony Pictures Entertainment last fall. This attack stole large amounts of data and rendered inoperable thousands of Sony's computers and servers. It was a game changer because it wasn't about profit. It was about a dictator trying to impose censorship and to prevent the exercise of free expression. At bottom, it was about coercion, which the United States believes is unacceptable and which is why we took the extraordinary step of publicly identifying North Korea as responsible for the attack and responded swiftly, imposing additional sanctions on Kim Jong-un's regime. In short, the threat is becoming more diverse, more sophisticated, and more dangerous. And I worry that malicious attacks like the one on Sony Pictures will increasingly become the norm, unless we adapt quickly and take a comprehensive approach, just as we have in other contexts. Which brings me to the counterterrorism model. Now, to be sure, there are many differences that make it difficult to apply all of the lessons learned from the counterterrorism experience to the cyber realm. For one, the private sector plays a more central role in spotting and responding to cyber incidents than it does in the counterterrorism realm, where the government largely takes the lead. But having observed the nation's response to terrorism post 9-11 from three different perches in the United States government, at the FBI, as Assistant Attorney General for National Security, at the Department of Justice, and now at the White House, I can tell you that there are structural, organizational, and cultural shifts that were made in our government in the counterterrorism realm that also apply to cyber. We need to develop the same muscle memory in the government response to cyber threats as we have for terrorist incidents. Structurally, since 9-11, our government has done the very hard work of breaking down walls in our counterterrorism agencies and bringing people together to share information so that we get the best possible assessment of the threat. Whenever possible, we're bringing partners together to share information and to extend our operational reach. This model has made our counterterrorism mission against an evolving enemy more effective and more sustainable. Like counterterrorism, meeting cyber threats requires a whole of government approach, one that uses all the appropriate tools available to us, including our global diplomacy, our economic clout, our intelligence resources, our law enforcement expertise, our competitive technological edge, and when necessary, our military capability. Those who would do us harm should know that they can be found and they will be held to account. In the cyber context, we need to share threat information more broadly 
and to coordinate our actions so that we are all working to achieve the same goal. And we have to do so consistent with fundamental values and in a manner that includes appropriate protections for privacy and civil liberties. We need to sync up our intelligence with our operations and respond quickly to threats against our citizens, our companies, and our nation. Make no mistake, over the last few years, we have developed new and better ways to collaborate across all levels of our government and with our partners in the private sector, including at the operational hubs in our government that are charged with monitoring threats, issuing warnings, sharing information, and protecting our critical infrastructure. At the White House, we've taken steps to improve our policy response. Last summer, following a rising number of breaches and intrusions to both public and private networks, we created what's called the Cyber Response Group, or the CRG. You know it's official because it has an acronym. The CRG is modeled on the very effective, highly effective, and long-standing counterterrorism security group. Like its terrorism analog, the CRG convenes the interagency and pools knowledge about ongoing threats and attacks and coordinates all elements of our government's response at the highest level. But despite this step and other steps and the progress that we've made, it has become clear that we can do more as a government to quickly consolidate, analyze, and provide assessments on fast-moving threats or cyber attacks. As President Obama said during the State of the Union last month, we will make sure our government integrates intelligence to combat cyber threats, just as we have done to combat terrorism. So today, I am pleased to announce that we will establish a new Cyber Threat Intelligence Integration Center, or CTIC, under the auspices of the Director of National Intelligence. Now, currently, no single government entity is responsible for producing coordinated cyber threat assessments, ensuring that information is shared rapidly among existing cyber centers and other elements within our government, and supporting the work of operators and policymakers with timely intelligence about the latest cyber threats and threat actors. The CTIC is intended to fill these gaps. In this vein, CTIC will serve a similar function for cyber as the National Counterterrorism Center does for terrorism, integrating intelligence about cyber threats, providing all source analysis to policymakers and operators, and supporting the work of existing federal cyber centers, network defenders, law enforcement communities. The CTIC will not collect intelligence. It will analyze and integrate information already collected under existing authorities. Nor will the CTEC perform functions already assigned to other centers. It's intended to enable them to do their jobs more effectively, and as a result, make the federal government more effective as a whole in responding to cyber threats. CTEC will draw on the existing cyber centers to better integrate their expertise and information to improve our collective response to cyber threats. Now, responding to today's threat is only part of the task. The real challenge is getting ahead of where the threat is trending. That's why the President's national security strategy identifies cyber as a critical focus area to ensure we both meet the challenges of today and prepare for the threats we'll face tomorrow. The President's budget backs up this commitment with $14 billion to protect our critical infrastructure government networks, and other systems. And later this week, at Stanford University, President Obama and I and several cabinet members will join hundreds of experts, academics, and private sector representatives for a first-of-its-kind White House summit to discuss how we can improve trust, enhance cooperation, and strengthen America's online consumer protections and cyber defenses.
but to truly safeguard Americans online and enhance the security of what has become a vast cyber ecosystem, we're going to have to work in lockstep with the private sector. The private sector cannot and should not rely on the government to solve all of its cybersecurity problems. At the same time, I want to emphasize that the federal government won't leave the private sector to fend for itself. Partnership is a precondition of success. There is simply no other way to tackle such a complicated problem. It requires daily collaboration to identify and analyze threats, address vulnerabilities, and then work together to respond jointly. To the private sector, we've made it clear that we will work together. We're not going to bottle up intelligence. If we've got information about a significant threat to a business, we're going to do our utmost to share it. In fact, within 24 hours of learning about the Sony Pictures Entertainment attack, the U.S. government pushed out information and malware signatures to the private sector to update their cyber defenses so they could take action. We want this flow of information to go both ways. The private sector has vital information we don't always get unless they share it with us. And the government has a unique capacity to integrate information about threats, including with non-cyber sources, to create the best possible picture to secure all of our networks. When companies share information with us about a major cyber intrusion or a potentially debilitating denial of service attack, they can respect us to respond quickly. We will provide as much information as possible, as much information as we can about the threat to assist companies in protecting their networks and their critical information. We'll coordinate a quick and unified response from government experts, including those at the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. We'll look to determine who the actor is and to hold them to account. And as we respond to attacks, we'll bring to bear all of the tools available to us and draw on the full range of government resources to disrupt threats. I want to commend companies that have shown strong leadership by coming forward as soon as they identify breaches and seeking assistance so we can work together to address threats more rapidly. This is good for the company, it's good for the consumer, and it's good for the government. Across the board, we're tearing down silos, increasing communication, and developing flexibility and agility to respond to cyber threats of the 21st century, just as we've done in the counterterrorism world. Moving forward, as our lives become more and more dependent on the internet, and the amount of territory we have to defend keeps expanding, our strategy will focus on four key elements. First, we need to improve our defenses, period. In particular, actively using the cybersecurity framework that was announced last year would enable every organization to manage cyber risk more effectively. Even just employing basic cyber hygiene could stop a large percentage of the intrusions we face, so we've got to start by getting the basics right. Second, we need to improve our ability to disrupt, respond to, and recover from cyber threats. That means using the full strength of the United States government, not just our cyber tools, to raise the costs for bad actors and deter malicious actors. Third, we need to enhance international cooperation, including between our law enforcement agencies, so that when criminals anywhere in the world target innocent users online, we can hold them accountable, just as we do when people commit crimes in the physical world. And fourth, we need to make cyberspace intrinsically more secure, replacing passwords with more secure technologies, building more resilient networks, and enhancing consumer protections online. President Obama will continue to do everything within his authority to harden our cyber defenses, but executive actions alone won't be enough. We need durable, long-term solutions codified in law that bolster the nation's 
cyber defenses. This is not and should not be a partisan issue. The future security of the United States depends on a strong bipartisan consensus that responds to a growing national security concern. Everyone shares responsibility here, including the Congress. In December, Congress passed important bills to modernize how the government protects its systems and to clarify the government's authorities to carry out its cyber missions. Today, we need the Congress to build on that progress by passing the package of cybersecurity measures that President Obama announced just last month that encourage greater information sharing, set a national standard for companies to report data breaches, and provides law enforcement with updated tools to combat cybercrime. And we look to Congress to pass a budget with critical funding for cybersecurity, including at the Department of Homeland Security. The administration is ready to work with Congress to pass these measures as quickly as possible. Cybersecurity is and will remain a defining challenge of the 21st century. With more than 3 billion internet users around the world and as many as 10 billion internet connected devices, there is simply no putting this genie back in the bottle. We have got to get this right. Our prosperity and security depend upon the internet being secure against threats, reliable in our ability to access information, open to all who seek to harness the opportunities of the internet age, and interoperable to ensure the free flow of information across networks and nations. We are at a crossroads and the clock is ticking. The choices we make today will define the threat environment we face tomorrow. All of us have a responsibility to act, to practice better cyber hygiene, to build greater resilience in our networks so we can bounce back from attacks, to break down silos and improve information sharing, as well as the integration and analysis of threats, to pass cybersecurity legislation, and to ensure that we take a comprehensive whole of government approach to respond to cyber attacks just as we do in other contexts. These are hard and very complicated issues, but I'm confident that working together, government, industry, advocacy groups, the public, and the Congress, our networks can be safer, our privacy protected, and our future more secure. I look forward to tackling these threats with all of you. Thanks very much. Lisa, thank you uh, for very comprehensive remarks. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Let's have a conversation, and then we will open it to a conversation from this room and from the overflow room. I hope somebody will give me questions from others who are outside this room. First of all, um, uh, I noticed as a recovering politician <laughs> your gentle pitch to Congress on a bipartisan basis, and I hope Congress is listening. It has occurred to me for years that the terrorists uh, won't check our party registration before they blow us up. And uh, this is obviously true in the cyber realm as well. The attacks on uh, all of this infrastructure that you uh, listed, not just the private sector, but also the postal service and so forth, didn't target Democrats or Republicans, did it? Nope, it did not. So uh, this is, in that sense, one size fits all. And I hope everyone in Congress is tuning in and realizing that there's more to do. Uh, you made a list of things that Congress has to do, more information sharing, uh, a, a standard setting, tools for law enforcement. You didn't mention immunity. And is that adequately dealt with, or does more have to be done there? And could you explain it to this audience? Sure thing. Um, it is a central feature of the package of measures that President Obama announced last month. And it goes directly to the heart of the first uh, in the list that was recorded there, information sharing. Uh, the president's legislation that he announced last month makes it clear uh, and proposes to provide liability protection uh, for sharing from the private sector with the government uh, to the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and in order to incentivize 
the private sector to provide that very, very critical information that I talked about in my speech. Now, not everybody's a lawyer, yep. so w why would a firm be liable uh, for sharing information? So there's any number of reasons. Well, I'm a recovering lawyer, as you know, and it so has, am been, I. has been noted. Um, but uh, as we have heard from, uh, from industry across the board, small, medium, large businesses, that uh, they face real choices and concerns about sharing information about breaches or hacks or intrusions into their networks. Uh, they want to share information with the government uh, about the uh, origins and what they find out about those breaches, but in doing so, they're concerned that it would, uh, the information they provide could include consumer information or they could be sued for seeming to include uh, consumer information. So what the President's proposal does is says straight out, uh, provide liability protection, targeted and um, uh, narrow liability protection for the purpose of a corporation pro providing that um, uh, computer security and cybersecurity information to the government after taking reasonable steps to remove private information, consumer information, so that the government can get that information in, look at it, compare it, and, and uh, analyze it along with all the other sources, classified <laughs> and otherwise, that the government has, and return that information to the public sector, to the private sector, state and local governments, uh, and the private sector holders of a huge, something approaching 85% of the cyber infrastructure. I was gonna go there, but let me ask one follow-up question just so everyone understands sure. what you're saying. So company X thinks it's hacked. Mm -hmm. The reason it should tell the government about this is what? And, and the information will be used how? So a few <laughs> things. One, um, we may have seen exactly that signature, that set of ones and zeros that a particular malicious cyber actor uses to do its destructive or denial of service or other attack that may even go to the integrity of data. So we may, once we look at it and put it together with all the other intelligence and information we have, we may say, we know what this is, we know who it is, we know how it's going to affect your system, and most importantly, we want to tell everybody else. We want to tell if that company that provided us, provided that information to us, is a um, power uh, plant producer or um, owner, we want to get it out to the rest of the energy sector. So by, com by when company X comes forward and is protected in a limited way yep. for doing so, Company X benefits. Company X benefits. In, in addition to Company X is being patriotic and helping the rest of the government that may provide, uh, or not the government, the rest of the the internet. The, so the this is why I talked about an ecosystem. We are all intertwined, as you noted in your remarks. One person's vulnerability, frankly, is everybody's vulnerability, uh, and so that's why we that's why it's so critical that we are working together. Well, I don't think there's a lot of pushback from Congress on the immunity issue. So why isn't Congress doing something? So this is, this is what we're really hoping we can galvanize uh, the Congress uh, to act. Because once you pair the um, uh, liability protection that is targeted in the way we've described with reasonable privacy protections, uh, this ought to be the kind of thing that we can get behind on a bipartisan basis. The other thing uh, I want to draw you out about, because I, again, I don't think there's uh, a lot of public understanding uh, of it, is the portion of critical infrastructure that is in the private sector. Mm -hmm. People should be aware that there is dot .mil, that is an internet system for our military. There's dot .gov, that is a system for our government. Mm -hmm. And then there's dot .com. How many people here have some form of internet account that ends in .com? Okay, how many of you are clueless? <laughs> <laughs> no, clueless people don't come to the Wilson Center. Okay, so Lisa, can you talk about the percentage of, let's just start with critical infrastructure that's in the private sector, and wh why leaving the private sector with inadequate tools exposes all of us? So. And the, you know, the, like most statistics, um, they're all over the place, but by any measure, 
so, you know, there's, there's references to 85% of uh, critical infrastructure and are um, uh, the backbone on which we ride, whether you're a power plant, whether you're a financial company, whether you're um, a shopping center, all of that resides, the vast, vast majority of it resides in private sector hands, state and local governments or privately owned. That means that the .gov piece or the .mil that is solely in control of the United States government is a very, very small portion. And so we are incredibly reliant for all the services we uh, rely on that are critical uh, in many instances uh, to our uh, life and sustenance, uh, whether it's a hospital or whether it's your financial um, bank account. Um, you are vulnerable if you are hooked up to the internet. So in my brilliant introduction, I referred to rail switches, water mains, power grids. Yep. What percentage of all this is in the private sector? All of it. All of it. Everybody hear that? State and local governments or the private sector, privately owned. That's not, it's not the federal government's responsibility. Um, it is, it doesn't come under the control of the federal government. And in any event, if you're hooked up to the internet, you're vulnerable. My former, uh, my former boss, uh, and somebody you know well, Gene, the former director uh, of the FBI, Robert Mueller, uh, said and has been quoted often, there's only two types of uh, company owners, those who have been hacked and those who will be hacked. Well, the Wilson Center's been hacked and we're pretty careful about things and we are taking precautions every day. Has anybody here never had an experience being hacked or <coughs> does anybody here not know someone who's been hacked? <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, one person. We're gonna call on you later and you're gonna explain <laughs> how you're so lucky. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, moving along, um, uh, something we brag about at the Wilson Center is how good our people are. That's, of course, why we're now in the top five think tanks in the U.S. Um, but my question is about how good are the people the government can hire to work on cyber issues? And I ask this because I'm well aware, and I know everyone here is, that the private sector pays much, much bigger salaries. Look, uh, we have the same... Um, or I should say greater recruiting and retaining challenges um, uh, that the private sector has. Uh, now, we can offer something, Jane, that the private sector, uh, not all the private sector can, and that is obviously a tremendous sense of mission. But uh, we've got to do more uh, to be able to hire uh, um, top-notch cyber talent. We've got tremendously talented people working in the NSA, in the FBI, in the Department of Homeland Security, in the Defense Department. These folks are top, top notch, but they also can be hired away um, for vast sums. So what do we have to do to we get these people to come and to stay? And by the way, I was at the NSA recently mm -hmm. uh, being briefed on some aspects of our programs, and they said that really good kids coming out of yep. uh, college are turning down much bigger salaries yep. Uh, to because they're patriotic and they want to protect uh, our country. So we've got a sense of mission that we can offer, and that's a huge uh, recruiting tool, but we need funds. We need the funds and the authorities uh, and the flexibility, in particularly in the Department of Homeland Security, to be able to do that extra hiring. This is the wave of the future. Is another obstacle to hiring some of these kids our security, our, our clearance system? Well, look, there is, um, there's always ways that we can do better to streamline the security clearance system. Uh, as the President's counterterrorism and Homeland Security Advisor, you're never going to hear me uh, say anything that would seem like we're scrimping uh, on security. But there's more that we can do to streamline that process uh, and to, to get people in uh, who are patriotic, who have huge skill sets, and who we can put to work. Well, uh, obviously, I'm not encouraging more Edward Snowdens to no. apply. <laughs> got that message. I think yeah. we all got that message. But what about a kid who um, incorrectly uh, downloaded music for free, <clears throat> which is not okay, on, on, on his, uh, uh, one of his systems? What about that kid who, honors, who answers that question correctly? Will well, he be cleared? You know, uh, 
not having uh, recently uh, gone through my security clearance, although I've had many, I didn't, I wasn't, uh, didn't have that question uh, trip me up. But, um, you know, look, what I would encourage folks uh, who are patriotic, obviously they're going to be, uh, the first thing is be honest on your, on your security clearance right. form. But something that is a, um, is a crime is, is going to be something you're going to have to talk about. Um, last question for me, and we'll have 20 minutes for audience questions, is about the only criticism I've heard uh, since uh, news uh, that you have just made here was printed in the newspaper this morning. Um, that's okay. <laughs> as long as you came here to deliver the speech, we're very happy. Uh, but the criticism was is that you're building an unnecessary uh, bureaucracy with the CTIC. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your answer to that? So my answer to that is, uh, Look, this, as I laid out in the speech, this is filling a critical gap. In uh, the NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center, uh, did nothing to take away the mission or the role and responsibility of CIA's Counterterrorism Center, of FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Forces, or uh, SIOC, uh, which is its operational hub. Um, those are operational arms and operational centers that have clear responsibilities and clear missions. What we need and the gap that the CTIC fills is critical, rapid, coordinated intelligence to feed those operations. So it's not duplicative at, uh, at all, Jane, and I think what we've seen uh, with NCTC in the terrorism realm is operators and policymakers are very, very well served in facing an evolving threat by having a source of rapid, integrated intelligence at their disposal. Well, expressing my personal opinion, I was there when uh, first the Terrorist Threat Integration Center was set up by uh, President Bush, and then it was renamed NCTC, and then Congress uh, codified NCTC as part of the 2004 intelligence reform law, and I think NCTC is terrific, and yes. shout out to the people who work there. Here, here. So if you're building something comparable to that that's going to work as well as that, my own view is you're, you're on the right track. Well, thank you. You think so? All right, folks. Uh, 18 minutes and uh, 40 seconds. <laughs> um, please uh, identify yourself and ask a question. Do not give a speech. Uh, right here. Uh, wait, wait for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Pete Baer with the Energy Wire. Could you elaborate on the second of your four action points? Mm -hmm. How can the government use all its capabilities more effectively to disrupt uh, serious threats to critical infrastructure before they occur? So it's a, it's a very good question. What I meant by that is, and the reference in the speech is, using all of our tools. Again, the terrorism uh, model is instructive. We get around, literally get around the table in the Situation Room. Our diplomats, our intelligence community, our military, our prosecutors and law enforcement officials, and we discuss what is the best way to disrupt this threat, to deter this actor, to, um, uh, to determine how to address the threat. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about with respect to cyber. So you see us using all of those tools, diplomacy, in trying to uh, work with uh, other governments to establish uh, cyber norms of behavior, uh, on the military side, on the intelligence side, on the law enforcement side. Just last spring, the Department of Justice, the National Security Division, something uh, I know a little something about, uh, brought indictments against uh, five members of the People's Liberation Army in China for conducting uh, cyber economic espionage in this country. Uh, that is uh, an effort to say we will uh, take, uh, take account of these actions. We will determine who, uh, who has committed uh, these malicious cyber actions and go after them. Uh, and then there is, of course, sanctions. Uh, and you see that in our response uh, to the actions of North Korea. So the idea is you're going to look at all your cyber tools uh, and you're going to you're going to look at all your tools, including your cyber tools, and determine which is the best one. I know it is U.S. policy not to do economic uh, uh, espionage. Correct. Could you explain the basis for that? Sure. Uh, and the president's been quite clear about this. We are not conducting and will not conduct uh, economic espionage for the benefit of our companies. Full stop. That's what the that's what the president has said, and 
That's what the intelligence community adheres to. Uh, question in, let me see on this side. In the middle over here, yes. Hi, Dave Pereira from Politico. Can you discuss a little bit where the personnel for this center are coming from? If they're coming from existing agencies, mm -hmm. are you just simply cannibalizing existing federal authorities or federal capabilities? Uh, the answer to that is no, uh, to the cannibalization. Um, <laughs> the government doesn't cannibalize. <laughs> Uh, look, the idea here is, uh, as uh, Jane referenced, um, you've got authorities uh, in the DNI, and this is what this is a, the reference, the parallel to NCTC is apt here. The uh, Director of National Intelligence has authorities under the um, uh, Terrorism uh, Reform and Prevention Act um, that was passed after 9/11 to create intelligence centers specifically for this mission to integrate and bring all sources of intelligence together. So yes, as NCTC does, this, uh, the CTIC will draw on expertise and an intelligence and analysts from uh, other centers and from other government agencies who have a national security responsibility and a cyber responsibility. We actually uh, promoted that idea mm -hmm. as part of intelligence reform because it gives people broader experience and they're able, instead of being in a silo where they don't see the whole picture, to do a, a more whole of government response, which is something I would assume, you're, which you mentioned you're trying to achieve. That's exactly right. I mean, this is, it's a really good point. Uh, in the intelligence community, if you are an analyst, um, uh, somebody who serves in the intelligence community, to get promoted, you have to have done something called joint duty. You have to go to, the, and I think this is a tremendously uh, smart innovation, uh, you have to have served in other agencies and seen what your partners in the intelligence community do, uh, and this can be part of that. By the way, jointness is also a strategy for the military. That's uh, right. A, a law called Goldwater Nichols, which passed in the 1980s, created the joint structure we have mm -hmm. with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And the whole notion is by pulling people together, you, uh, y you have a better chance of bringing the best capabilities together. That's exactly right. Uh, right over here, uh, third row. Claire Casey Garten Rothkopf. I was hoping you could comment on the December attack on the German steel mill. Um, is this the beginning of a new era of cyber attack where it's actually causing damage to physical assets or potentially people? And does that change the game? Do we have the right tools for that? So um, you're on to something here, and this I uh, alluded to it and actually spoke directly to it in my speech, which is um, the, the North Korea attack on Sony Pictures Entertainment was, as we have said, a game changer because it was both destructive and coercive. Uh, we saw in 2012 uh, an attack, a destructive attack on Saudi Aramco, large uh, oil uh, facility and producer. 30,000 uh, computers just created, turned into bricks, basically. Uh, this is incredibly destructive, obviously, and it has a huge impact uh, on economies, on bottom lines. And uh, that is uh, the thing, as I said in my speech, that is probably the most concerning to me. That and what I would say is another element of destructive cyber behavior is manipulating and, and leaving um, an impact that makes us question the integrity of data when you don't know what has really happened. And so you uh, lose trust and, and faith and confidence in the data that's there. Uh, right in the center here, the man in glasses. Yeah. Hello, Chunanjun from Triple A. Yes. As you mentioned, the uh, third strategy out of four for responding cyber threats has international cooperation. Uh, are there any concrete plans that the White House have to lead the cyber issues in a global view? Mm -hmm. So it's a great question, um, and the President Obama has spoken to this when he talked about. The, um, the Sony Pictures uh, uh, attack. Uh, we've got to do more work, quite frankly, on galvanizing international cyber norms. Things like getting the international community to all agree and sign up to the fact that we're not going to commit a cyber attack on critical infrastructure. Another country or state's critical infrastructure ought to be something that we can, we can sign up to. Okay, on this side, uh, on the aisle. Hi, Steve Birnbaum, uh, independent consultant. Um, you said that the fourth pillar was making the internet more uh, intrinsically secure. 
yet for on the counter-terror side, law enforcement's reaction to the default encryption from Apple and Google, uh, as well as secure messaging platforms from law enforcement both here and in the UK has been, um, shall we say, less than enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. So we're, to how far does that pillar extend for intrinsically secure? Uh, after all, um, security experts consider any kind of backdoor to be an um, inherent vulnerability. You used the word default encryption. Maybe yes. you'd explain that to other people. Um, with the latest release from both Google on the Android platform and Apple uh, on, the I on the iPhone platform, um, they have implemented strong encryption by default so that if the phone is, is compromised physically, um, nobody can obtain any data from it. So your data is inherently secure on it and Apple has no um, easy way or law enforcement has no easy way to recover it. So that would seem to support an intrinsic security of our information, yet the reaction from law enforcement to not having uh, a backdoor into these security systems has been very negative. So uh, I think you've raised two very important issues, uh, and I'll take the consumer protection piece uh, second because it's something we're going to be talking about later this week in Stanford. On the first issue you raised, I think you were referring to comments that uh, Director Comey and others have made. And in fact, President Obama spoke about this uh, in recently uh, in his press conference with Prime Minister Cameron. Look, there's incredible value from strong encryption, privacy enhancing, privacy protection uh, that we all want. By the same token, as the President has observed, uh, there is a real concern if we cannot have and give legal effect to court orders uh, that would uh, allow law enforcement to have access to information or evidence that stops terrorist attacks, that stops malicious cyber attacks, that stops crimes. And so we've got to have a dialogue about this. We've got to have uh, a real informed discussion. Uh, that's what Director Comey is, has called for. It's what the President has called for. Uh, and so I think you, you've raised uh, an important uh, point about a dialogue that we do uh, need to have on the consumer protection piece, which these things are quite obviously related. This is one of the things we're talking about in Stanford uh, in, uh, in a few days, uh, talking specifically about consumer protections online. What are the new uh, and next generation of payment systems uh, that could move us past the password to, um, uh, to multi-factor authentication? Never thought I'd say that in <laughs> front of a the mouth group ball. of cameras. But um, uh, se other secure forms of payment, whether it's uh, biometrics or uh, using uh, additional things that move us beyond the password so we get to a more inherently secure payment system. Um, uh, let's go in the middle, sort of your hand is still up, sir. You're the one. And by the way, if there are questions from the overflow room, someone needs to hand them to me uh, in the near future. <laughs> Christian Beckner from the Center for Hi Cyber and Homeland Security at the George Washington University. Uh, you mentioned that a key distinction between counterterrorism and cybersecurity was the tremendous role of the private sector, not just as a target, obviously, but as a collector and, a, and as an analyst of, of cyber threats. Given that distinction, how are you envisioning the CTIC being different from the NCTC in terms of how it's organized and staffed and, and, and so on? So uh, the distinction I was trying to draw is obviously uh, in the terrorism realm and in, in, in the homeland security space, um, we have this ethos of see something, say something, which is obviously tremendously important, and that's geared at the public sector and that's geared at citizens. Um, but this goes to the issue Jane and I think we're talking about at the outset, which is uh, because so much of uh, our critical infrastructure and our infrastructure period is in private sector hands. We're relying in large measure, in significant measure, on information about vulnerabilities and attacks that happen to the private sector. So that uh, has a space, at least under our proposal uh, that the President announced last uh, month, which is to say if you're a company and you find out you've been hacked or there's been a breach, provide information to the Department of Homeland Security, to uh, its uh, National uh, Communications and Cybersecurity uh, Center, the NCIC. Um, give that, who, who is set up to be a network defender and to engage specifically with the private sector, give that information in. That will then be shared appropriately with the rest of the federal government's cybersecurity apparatus to include the new CTIC. 
uh, CTIC can uh, pair that private sector information along with classified intelligence and other information that we in the government uniquely have. So the idea is to get a two-way street going here where a private sector brings in information, we use it, and put it back out. I assume you will, as soon as you're, you've got this whole thing up, communicate how to be in touch with it. Absolutely. What safeguards do you have against people um, uh, putting misinformation, disinformation into the system? So uh, this is the type of thing we're talking about in uh, the proposal that the president uh, announced last month, which is to say, you're a private corporation. We want you to provide that information. It's vital. But we want you to take steps, uh, reasonable steps, to ensure that you're not, A, giving the government private, personally identifying information, uh, and you're not um, uh, providing, uh, obviously, malicious, um, uh, malicious code or malicious information. So there's a responsibility also on the part of the private sector to take those privacy-enhancing steps. Well, I get that. It, you know, you're, you're at you work for Target and you're trying mm -hmm. to communicate the right information. What if you don't work for Target and you pretend you do mm -hmm. and you're communicating information? So that's why we want that information to come into the Department of Homeland Security that's set up to ensure that we're not going to be propagating uh, malware or, um, uh, or malicious code uh, and so we don't have a vicious cycle here. And one more question while we're on that subject. The black market for exploits and malware is growing. Please do not tell us precisely what you're doing about it because then people will work around that. But can you assure us that you're doing all the right things <laughs> and finding and getting rid of the exploits and the malware that is available for sale for cheap on the black market? As you said, uh, this is something we're very focused on. Uh, this hacker for hire approach, this, the, uh, the criminal networks that uh, can and are behind a lot of this malicious cyber activity is something uh, that we're very focused on uh, and is not something people should be underestimating. Okay, we're going to take two last questions together because we're out of time. One is back there, blue shirt, hand up, there you are. Hi, thanks. I'm Eamon Javers with CNBC. Uh, Forbes.com today is saying that uh, its website was hacked uh, by apparently Chinese hackers who were targeting a financial services firm, readers of Forbes.com, as well as U.S. defense contractors. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, that particular incident and who might have done it, and also the technique of hitting third-party websites with an eye toward capturing the eyeballs that are going to that website as and a cyber threat? Hold that answer. Uh, mm -hmm. The woman in the front row. Uh, my name is Kendra. Wait, wait. Mm -hmm. My name is Kendra Pengelly with the European Parliament Liaison Office, and I continue to hear about need for international cooperation, but I've yet to hear a realistic framework. Internet's inherently international. What's our response to that, or, or how can you detail? So on the last piece, I think um, this issue of uh, having norms uh, and getting and garnering international support for cyber norms, this is something the President and uh, Prime Minister Cameron talked about in terms of uh, they announced a cyber working group to address particularly uh, uh, hacks and breaches into the financial sector. So those types of partnerships and garnering international support for a set of norms uh, is something that I think could be, uh, is something we really do need to focus on. With respect to the gentleman's question in the back, uh, I can't uh, tell you uh, anything about uh, the uh, breach of which you referred. I would say, though, it sounds like, not having um, been briefed yet on it, it sounds like exactly the type of thing uh, that we are going to continue to be concerned about and we're going to see more and more of, which is exactly why we need something like the CTIC which in order to bring in that information very rapidly, say, is this something that we've seen before and get that information back out for the benefit of the private sector as well as the United States government. Uh, well, on a, that happy note, uh, first I want to thank uh, Lisa Monaco from for escaping from the White House Thank for an hour to uh, illuminate the subject for us. I also uh, want to observe that here's an instance of the White House putting out some executive orders that aren't getting blasted mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and that are, I hope, adding some protections to all of us. But step two is Congress getting in this picture. Exactly. And there are obviously things that, that executive orders cannot do That's on right. this subject and many other subjects. And uh, as someone who has 
been in this game for a long time, I, uh, the, the obvious lack of partisanship is apparent and the need for all of us to work together, whether we're in the dot com, dot gov, or dot mil space is apparent. And so um, uh, on behalf of, of me, but also uh, a lot of uh, the initiatives at the Wilson Center, we hope that uh, uh, forums like this will shed light on policy options and policy makers will act. And again, Lisa Monaco, thank you for thank spending you. an hour thank with us. Thank you for your service.